Morality concerns actions. Actions that are performed, such as drunk driving, theft, rape, and murder. Actions not performed, such as a failure to keep a promise or to repay a debt, or failure to help somebody in need. But what is an intentional action? Whatever intentional actions are, they're somehow related to a person's psychology, with the type of person they are, and how their brain works. This presentation will set out in a very basic way what is the most widely regarded understanding of the relationship between psychology and behavior. Now, don't overthink this. The basic idea is something you are extremely familiar with. You use this method constantly to understand the behavior of the people around you. You're watching this video. A friend steps into the room and asks, what are you doing? You tell them that you're watching some boring video on psychology or behavior or something, and your friend asks why. You might answer, I find the subject interesting and I want to know more about it. I think that this video will help me to understand it. Or you might say, it's for my philosophy class. I want to pass the class and I'll get a better grade if I understand this material. The one thing that I want you to notice is that whatever answer you give, it will have something to do with your beliefs and your desires. In both of these hypothetical answers, you've identified a goal and a belief that relates the action to the achievement of that goal. In the first case, the goal is understanding the relationship between psychology and action. And the belief is that watching this video will provide you with an improved understanding. In the second case, the goal is a higher grade. And the belief is that watching this video will help to contribute to a higher grade. In either case, two psychological states, a belief and a desire, support the act of watching the video. The desire sets the goal, whatever it is the agent wants to accomplish, and the belief determines which action will best realize that goal without sacrificing other goals that the agent may have. What we're going to do is take a closer look at these states. By the way, the view I'll be discussing here is widely attributed to the 18th century Scottish philosopher David Hume. There's some dispute as to whether Hume actually held this theory, but that's not our concern here. If Hume didn't actually hold this theory, he at least inspired it. Our concern here is with what the theory says. On this account, beliefs and desires are propositional attitudes. You may ask, what's a propositional attitude? My answer to that question is that a propositional attitude is an attitude towards a proposition, at which point your reaction might be, thanks, but that's not helpful. Okay, so let me try to be a little bit more helpful. Let's go back a step and ask, what's a proposition? A proposition is the meaning of a sentence. It's what a sentence is about. Take the sentence, I can speak French. It refers to the speaker and reports that the speaker is capable of uttering understandable sentences in the language of French. Now take the sentence, je peux parler français. It's a different sentence, but it expresses the same proposition. Both sentences, even though they use different words, if spoken by the same person, say the same thing. They express the same proposition. The most important feature of a proposition, at least for our purposes, is that they are capable of being true or false. The statement, I can speak French, might be false. Perhaps the individual is lying, trying to impress somebody. Or perhaps a person mistakenly believes that the ability to utter a half dozen sentences in a language means that they can speak that language. Or the statement might be true. Now that we know what a proposition is, we can go back and look at propositional attitudes. A proposition is the meaning of a sentence and is capable of being true or false. A belief is an attitude that a proposition is true, that it accurately describes the world. A person who believes that they can speak French believes that the proposition, I can speak French, is true, that it does accurately describe the world. A belief could be false, though it's kind of difficult to imagine a person mistaken in their belief as to whether or not they can speak French. However, if somebody has the belief vaccinations cause autism, 
then they have the attitude that the proposition vaccines cause autism is true, even though it's not the case that the proposition accurately describes the world. Yet the person who has this belief thinks that it accurately describes the world. That's what it means to believe something. That person can be expected to act as if the proposition was true, assuming, of course, that they had the belief. Perhaps acting in ways that they'll come to regret when their expectations of the world don't hold up. Now let's compare beliefs to desires. Imagine somebody has a desire to speak French. We can put this into propositional form by saying that this is a desire, from the point of view of the speaker, that I can speak French. The person isn't saying that the proposition I can speak French is true. What they're doing is expressing a preference. They're stating that they would prefer a world in which I can speak French is true over a world in which I can speak French is not true. Similarly, a parent with a desire that my child is healthy is saying that they would prefer a world in which the proposition my child is healthy is true over a world in which my child is healthy is false. So beliefs and desires are propositional attitudes. They express different attitudes towards a proposition being true. A belief attitude towards a proposition is that the proposition is true, that it does accurately describe the world. A desire attitude towards a proposition is a preference for a world in which the proposition is true over a world in which the proposition is false. Next, we're going to look at motivation. Let's say that there's a person who wants to speak French, or in other words, an individual that has a desire that I can speak French. Let's further assume that this individual doesn't currently speak French and is aware of that fact. Here we're saying that the agent has a preference. The agent would prefer a world in which I speak French is true over one in which I speak French is false. Our agent then acquires a belief that if they were to go through a particular course of study, then they will be able to speak French. In other words, they could create a world in which the proposition I speak French is true. The agent now has a motive to take that course of study. It might not be a very strong motive. When the individual thinks about the time and effort involved and the other things they could be doing with that time, they might decide that it's not worth it. Or they might want to speak French badly enough that they decide to spend the effort. Take another example. Our agent in this case has a desire not to be in pain. The agent prefers a world in which they are not experiencing pain over one in which they are experiencing pain, all else being equal. The agent also has a belief that being badly burned would result in being in pain. It'd create a world in which agent is not in pain is false. Consequently, the agent has a motive to avoid being badly burned. And here's a third example. A parent has a desire that their child be healthy. That is to say, the parent prefers a world where their child is healthy over a world in which their child is suffering from some illness. The parent also has a belief that vaccinations cause autism. The parent then has a motive to refuse to have the child vaccinated. So we can say that a person has a motive to perform some action if the action would make true a proposition that is the object of a desire in a world where the agent's beliefs are true. For example, a parent with a belief that vaccines cause autism and a desire that the child be healthy has a motive not to have the child vaccinated. In a world where the parents' beliefs were true, in a world in which vaccines actually do cause autism, the act of refusing vaccinations would help preserve the truth of the proposition that the child is healthy. Or, for another example, in this case we're wondering whether a suspect had a motive to commit murder. We learn that the suspect believed that the victim was spreading lies about him that cost him his job and his reputation. This turns out to be false. However, the fact that the belief is false doesn't change the fact that the suspect had a motive for murder. But, once again thinking about the parent who believes that vaccines cause autism, 
Does the parent have a reason to refuse to have the child vaccinated? In common English, we sometimes use the word reason as a synonym for motive. If we were to ask what reason does parent have to refuse to have the child vaccinated, we may say that the reason is her belief that vaccines cause autism. But we already have a word, motive, that we can use in those cases, meaning that we can reserve the word reason for something a bit more precise. Here we'll be using the phrase has a reason, as when we say that a person has a reason to perform some action, to refer to the case in which performing some action actually will make or keep a proposition that's the object of a desire true. So, our parent with the false belief that vaccines cause autism has a motive to refuse to have the child vaccinated, but has no reason to refuse. In fact, the parent has a strong reason to have the child vaccinated. The parent just doesn't recognize that fact. How is this the case? Recall that the parent has a desire that the child stay healthy. Vaccinating the child will, in fact, in the real world, protect the child from serious disease. So even though the parent is not motivated to have the child vaccinated, the parent has reasons to have the child vaccinated. There's one last point I want to consider before I close out this discussion. We've said here that what makes it the case that somebody has a reason to do something is that they have a desire that would be served by doing it. The reason to learn French is because one has a desire to be able to speak French. The reason to avoid being burned is a desire not to be in pain. The reason to have one's children vaccinated is a desire that one's children be healthy. When we say that somebody ought to do something, we're saying that there's a reason for them to do it. After all, if we say, you ought to do X, it would be perfectly reasonable for them to ask why. And the only answer that would make any sense is to tell the person a reason to do X. So here's a potential problem. This seems to require that it can't be true that a person morally ought to do something, like rescue a child or keep a promise or refrain from violent assault, unless they have a desire that would be served by that action. This is a matter of great controversy in moral philosophy, with a great deal written on the subject. In the space remaining, I'll offer one potential answer to the problem, the one that I think makes the most sense. If we look at the two claims, the first one is a claim about what a person has a reason to do. The second one is a claim about what there is a reason for somebody to do. And these aren't the same thing. Having a reason to perform some action means that one has a desire that would be served by performing that action. Whereas saying that there is a reason to perform some action is to say that there is a desire that would be served by performing some action. The desires that moral reasons refer to need not be those of the agent. They may refer to the reasons that other people generally have to condemn those who fail to do what they should or who do what they should not. There are reasons to condemn the person who fails to rescue a child. There's the reasons of the child themselves and the child's family. There are reasons to condemn those who fail to keep promises or who commit violent assaults against others. There are lots of reasons and nearly everybody has them. And they do not depend on the reasons that the agent has for performing or not performing some action. So to reiterate the point, on this account, to say that you morally ought to do something is to say that there are reasons to condemn those who fail to do that thing in those circumstances. Okay, now let me summarize. This has largely been a video dedicated to understanding some basic concepts. We've looked at the concepts of propositional attitude, which is an attitude towards a proposition, such as the proposition, I can speak French. Beliefs, the attitude that the proposition is true. Desires, a preference for a world in which the proposition is true over a world in which the proposition is false. Having a motive to do something means that the action would make the proposition that is the object of a desire true, if the world is as one believes it to be. A person may have a motive to murder somebody they think witnessed their crime even if that person didn't actually witness the crime. 
Having a reason to do something means that the action would make the proposition that is the object of a desire that the person has true in the real world, even if that person doesn't know it. Parents who want their children to be healthy have a reason to have their children vaccinated. And finally, to say that there are reasons for somebody to do something is to say that there are desires that would be served by their doing it. Somebody has desires that would be served by their performing that action, though the agent may not know or care about the fact that such reasons exist. Ultimately, as I said at the beginning, don't overthink it. These are all parts of the ways in which we normally think about the behaviors of other people. They describe relationships between beliefs, desires, and actions. These relationships are thought to go a long way to explaining why people do the things they do. And it plays an important role in getting people to do the things they should and preventing them from doing the things they should not.